Dr. Kimberly Morgan. She's an associate professor at Georgetown University. Oh, George Washington. George Washington, excuse me. Um, she began her studies at Northwestern where she graduated um, summa cum laude. Then she received her master's and doctorate from Princeton in political science. Um, she's received many awards and grants for her excellent research in European politics, comparative social policy, health, and migration, health policy and migration politics, including the Shadow Briand Scholarship for Studies in France and both the Lipset Award um, and the American Political Science Associ Association Award for Best Dissertation in her field. Um, she's presented her research at conferences and debates from Paris to Harvard and has published extensively, including two books, um, one of which was one of our textbooks for um, Professor Stevens' class, um, Working Mothers in the Welfare State, and her newest book, which was published this year, The Delegated Welfare State, Medicare, Markets, and Governance of American Social Policy. Um, Dr. Morgan speaks Dutch and is fluent in French. So uh, along the way in her education and career path, uh, she spent a lot of time in Western Europe, and the differences between the social policies there and ours here caught her attention. She wanted to know why the U.S. didn't have a lot of the same social provisions that she found in Europe. Because she wanted to have a career and children at the same time, it was particularly important for her to research work family policies. Uh, that research brought more questions. Those questions have led to comparative research. She enjoy, enjoys talking directly to people about family work policies and spends a lot of time trying to find what it is parents actually want. And that's a difficult question, even in the best of circumstances. But to stop there is to pigeonhole her. Kimberly is also a mother. She has a three-year-old, and she has been married for 10 years. So the very policies that she studies directly affect her life. Kimberly is the first to tell you that balancing work and family life is a constant challenge, and it is clear that her life constantly informs her research. I would add that it gives her deeper insight and her voice more veracity. All right, so today we're going to hear about um, a paper that some of us have read called Path Shifting of Welfare State Electoral <coughs> Competition and the Expansion of Work Family Policies in Western Europe. Uh, I believe we'll be hearing especially about the UK, Netherlands, and Germany and some of the work family uh, reforms they've had in the last couple of decades. So, Beautiful. Thank you so much. It's such a delight to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and I was so shocked uh, and pleased and slightly embarrassed to learn that John assigns my book to your class. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you write these books and you sort of half hope nobody will ever read them. I mean, you, you know, you won't be able to read them, but then, oh, you know, it's kind of painful. But anyway, I'm, I, I, in fact, I am quite flattered and pleased that, to know that, that it's actually being read, that it didn't just fall into a void, uh, which is sort of what it feels like when you finish one of these books. So today I'm going to talk about an aspect of what's going on with work family policies in Western Europe, namely expansions in public investments in and attention to this area of public policy. Um, and what area am I talking about? I'm talking about child care and parental leave and working time policies that affect how parents deal with the challenges of combining work and family. And this paper that I wrote, uh, that some of you have read, that I sent out, um, I hope is the last time I'm actually going to write on this topic. I note with some amount of despair that I started working on this subject in 1997. Uh, and while it's a great topic and one I care a lot about, there is some danger, I think, that we tend to say the same things over and over again. And so it's important to kind of move on and, and move into some other areas. Nonetheless, when I finished the book, I did feel that there was some unfinished business in my own thinking. So I'll just say a few words about the book itself and, and, and how, how I felt about it at the end of it. Basically, my dissertation, which became uh, my book, sought to explain these public policies towards child care and parental leave circa late 1990s, which was when I was doing my research. And for those of you who have read it, you know it's a very historical account that emphasized how religious cleavages shaped European political development and how these cleavages influenced party formation and structure, patterns of relationship between the state and civil society, and ideologies about gender roles and the family and that these factors then shaped the politics of child care throughout the 19th century or the 20th century and more broadly the politics around uh, gender roles and work and family. So in making this argument that st started way back in the 19th century, the book emphasized the path dependence of some early political choices and early political factors that then shaped the context in which subsequent policy making occurred. And I think this uh, heavily path-dependent historical argument was in part a reflection of some of the particularities of the cases that I was studying. I started my research in France. Now, usually when people study the welfare state, they start in the UK or they start in Sweden. And that frames the way they think about issues. When you start in France or you start in a country that's less conventionally studied, 
you notice some different things in the kinds of questions you pose are different. So in the French case, the fact of the very early development of a universal education system that included preschool education in the late 19th century led me to this more historically grounded, path-dependent kind of approach. But I think my approach also reflected a lot of the dominant thinking of the time that um, the 1990s was really a time of the ascent of, the, of an institutionalist approach in comparative politics that emphasized institutional stickiness. The whole literature on the new politics of the welfare state portrayed states mired in the consequences of past policy choices struggling to adapt to new circumstances. And that states were, welfare states in particular, were really failing to grapple with new social risks or new problems um, or be responsive to new social risk groups. To the extent welfare state, uh, states were described as changing, a lot of the literature described it in terms of retrenchment. So there, there did emerge a literature on welfare state change that said change was possible, but a lot of it was about why some states are better able to cut social programs than others. I think my approach also reflected the particular time that I was writing my dissertation. My research, as I said, started in 1997. Uh, and it was a time of relative stasis in work family policies. There were some pioneers, Sweden and Denmark and Norway and France, that had you know, long ago uh, by that point uh, created programs and institutionalized programs. But in a lot of the rest of Europe, nothing was really going on in this area, which was rather startling. Um, one of the cases I looked at, the Netherlands, there, wa there were changes going on, but it wasn't clear how much, uh, you, you know, what to make of them. It's always hard when you study something that's in progress because you don't know the end of the story yet. So I wasn't sure how meaningful these changes would be. But nonetheless, by the time I transformed my dissertation into a book and was publishing it, uh, it came out in 2006, but I think I was finishing it up in 2005, 2004, I could nonetheless see that there were changes happening in a number of countries. And I couldn't really make sense of them with the, with the framework that I developed in my dissertation that I was kind of stuck with at that point in the book. Uh, and in fact, I felt somewhat trapped in the dissertation that I'd written. Um, it had to become a book and fast so that I could get tenure. Uh, so I didn't really have time to totally reconceptualize <laughs> everything, come up with all new framework. So I was, you know, it's kind of a path dependent situation for me as well. So thus, I, I finished the book kind of feeling like, well, that's a nice historical study, but what's going on now? And I knew that was unfinished business in the, in the book. But I think my struggles were re reflective of a larger problem in welfare state research, which was that scholars by this point had not been really in the habit anymore of thinking about the politics of welfare state expansion, certainly not of the contemporary period. So they were particularly uh, not well equipped to explain why Germany, a very conservative um, welfare state and conservative towards family and gender roles, in 2006 and 2007 adopted major changes in their work family policies, creating Nordic style parental leave, a 12 month uh, well paid leave uh, with two daddy only months in it, uh, making major investments in childcare via funds directed to the lender, the municipalities and, the, and state governments. Really all our theories about Germany were about the entrenchment of Christian democratic conservatism with regard to the family and the problem of a semi-sovereign state, a state institutionally constrained uh, and incapable of re reforming itself, particularly given the difficulties in the federal relationships that made it hard to figure out how to uh, advance uh, an agenda of expanding childcare, which had to be done through these municipalities. Nonetheless, these reforms were done under a Christian Democratic family minister operating under a grand coalition government who found a way around these obstacles in the federal system. Similarly, uh, Dutch policy, by the time I was finishing my book, I came to start to see, and as I spent more time there, really appreciate just how transformative that policy had been in, th in casting off the old male breadwinner model, which had been the dominant model in the Netherlands. That the Netherlands went from having some of the lowest rates of women's employment in Europe to some of the highest, albeit with a lot of reliance on part-time work. And this was underpinned by a major increase in the availability of childcare. In 1990, around 6% of children under the age of three were in childcare. In 2006, that was 26%. So a big change in that period. Certainly one can point to various limitations in Dutch policy from the standpoint of gender equality. For instance, the Dutch policy model assumes that at least one parent <coughs> is working part-time, maybe they work three or four days a week and that the child is in childcare only you know, three or four days a week as well. And usually it turns out to be the mother. So you know, certainly there's a lot of traditionalism still built into the policy, but I think it's an inescapable fact that Dutch society and public policy has fundamentally changed. <clears throat> 
Then I think the UK also engaged in quite significant change. Now, I was long a skeptic about how important these changes were, and I kept arguing with people about this at conferences and so on, but I think I finally am kind of convinced that, in fact, there has been some significant change. That under new labor, a number of reforms were enacted. Maternity leave was expanded continually from 18 weeks to 12 months. It's paid for 39 weeks, and the amount of pay of it has increased. Child care, uh, the government created tax subsidies for child care that helped underwrite the growth of a private market of child care that hadn't existed before, increased spending on public services, and created an entitlement to 15 hours of free preschool uh, a week for all three and four year olds. I think the changes are less significant than compared to the Netherlands and Germany, but nonetheless I think we have to kind of keep in mind where the UK was that not only did the UK previously lack public programs for children, but didn't even have the subsidies in place to encourage any kind of private markets or nonprofit organizations to develop child care services. And that made it quite different from the US, where we also don't have a lot of public provision, but we've always had, or at least for decades, we've had private markets that stand in and that are publicly subsidized uh, through the tax code. And whereas in contrast, in the UK, women were actually taxed on any help they got from employers in paying for childcare. So there really it was a very kind of classic male breadwinner model until the late 1990s. So I think with that in mind, the UK has actually changed a lot, uh, even if one might point to its many limitations in some of these policy changes. Um, if my PowerPoint presentation were working, I would show you evidence of the change. So you're just going to have to believe me uh, when I say I have a nice graph that shows the increase in spending on family-related services. Um, what you see is the UK and the Netherlands increasing their spending and getting much closer to where the Scandinavian countries and France are, the, the sort of pioneers. Germany also a, tr a quite significant increase in um, child care services since the investments started with a new law in 2007. So you're seeing it's a process that's ongoing, but quite significant increase in, in availability of child care. Now I should note what I am not saying here. I'm not saying that any of these countries are moving toward the social democratic or Swedish model of work family policies, which is usually the kind of benchmark uh, against which all policies are compared in the literature. Um, and, but I think the problem with this is that it's led scholars, and especially feminist scholars and other progressively minded researchers, to always emphasize the negatives and the policy changes that happen everywhere else. So yes, change happened, but yeah, it's not Sweden, so, hmm, you know. Uh, and a lot of the negatives people would highlight, and I'm happy to talk more about the you know, limitations of the Dutch policies and the UK policies. <coughs> you know, I probably would agree with a lot of the criticism, but I think the result has been a tendency to downplay or ignore the fact of change, and thus the need to explain the change. To give an example, I was talking earlier about new labor's policies of increasing spending on family and children, but I found surprisingly in the literature that few people wanted to explain why this happened or even acknowledge that it had been much of a change. Instead, much of the work of British scholars is complaining about how disappointing new labor is and how disappointing these policies uh, are. And I think what gets lost is the fact that the UK did go from having virtually no family policy uh, and a quite strong male breadwinner orientation to, a, to uh, policies that actually do try to help families balance um, you know, work and family life. And what's especially notable is the huge change in the political rhetoric around this issue and the massive change in the Conservative Party in particular, but also Labour's language and thinking and talking about these issues, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. So um, the paper thus, um, you know, oh yeah, so to kind of conclude on that point, I think one lesson that I got from this, uh, and especially in, in the work I did on the British case where I could find nothing but negatives about new labor, um, is that it's, it's important even though a, a lot of us scholars bring uh, political commitments with us to our work, sometimes we need to check them at the door lest they get in the way of our analysis so we can kind of see clearly what's going on in front of us. <coughs> So what this paper uh, does is take three cases, the UK, Germany, and the Netherlands, and I try to explain why they changed policy in this expansionary direction. Why are they spending more on work family policies? Why have they abandoned their adherence to the male breadwinner uh, model? And why do political parties in these countries now all basically say that they support mother's employment, with some political parties still somewhat divided on this, but nonetheless, I think the public rhetoric has changed a lot. So how I studied this was through a rather laborious uh, process tracing uh, over time. I think I read every article in The Guardian on this topic in the UK for about 15 years, which was a very large file. 
Um, you know, basically what I do when I do this qualitative work is I reconstruct the process. I go temporally and I make a huge document that's a chronology of everything that happens and, and when it happens and uh, other types of things that are going on at that time. Like what is public opinion saying? and What is the secondary literature saying about what parties are doing at that time? And I pull all that information together to see over time what seems to be <coughs> producing the, the change that we're interested in. I also, in using these three cases, I make a somewhat unusual use of the comparative method, although certainly people do this, but I think our typical approach in using the comparative method is to find countries that differ on their outcome. And then we compare them and we try as hard as we can to say that we were controlling for the differences between the countries and we're trying to explain variation in the outcome, so different outcomes, different am amounts of change in, in, in uh, work family policies, for instance. But I think the reality is that actually most countries differ so much that you can pretend you're controlling for differences between them, but in fact you're usually not or you can't. Uh, because there are too many differences between countries. So by contrast, when you take countries that are quite different and see them going in a similar direction, you can s then ask, well, what is the one thing they have in common? I mean, what is the commonality here? Um, and that's actually a kind of a useful research strategy, at least it was in this case, and I think it gave me some leverage on trying to figure out what was happening. So the argument then that I make is that these policy shifts reflect the consequences of electoral competition around female voters. And I started in my thinking on this from what we know about the origins of welfare states in Western Europe throughout the 20th century, that they were created by political parties that emerged out of the major cleavages in European societies. That class and religion were these major cleavages, and the parties that came out of these put their distinctive ideological stamp on welfare states through the kinds of programs that they adopted. So following the work of Walter Corpy and John Stevens and others, social democratic power and, social demo uh, par and those parties produced social democratic welfare states, that following the work of Van Kersbergen and Esping Anderson, Christian Democrats and conservatives forged their own distinctive approach to the welfare state. But nonetheless, society certainly has not stood still for these parties, that already in the post-war period they were faced with social <coughs> structural changes that had intensified by the 1960s and certainly by the 70s and 80s, the decline of the working class for social democratic and labor parties and the emergence of white collar workers, in particular the rise of women's workforce participation and education levels, changed the kinds of constituents that were out there potentially mobilizable by the, by the labor party or by social democratic parties. The decline of religion, important, in, in diminishing the strength of more traditionalist ideologies about the family and a doctrine of subsidiarity that would hold that the state should have no role in shaping the decisions and, 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 and um, decisions about child rearing, decisions about child care. Some consequences of this, though, for parties, the immediate issue for them was the de-alignment of their voting base uh, and a not always successful realignment of those voters to attach them to uh, other parties. And so what people have seen in studying electoral politics in Europe for the last couple of decades is growing electoral volatility as voters no longer predictably attach themselves to a particular party, but will move around depending on uh, a variety of things, and especially the rise of issue competition that voters are looking for particular issues or maybe particular leaders uh, that will draw them to a party. And with issue competition, this reflects the fact that parties are no longer able to rely on well-established uh, demographic groups to vote for them, as in the past, and that parties instead have to compete around issues and lure voters around the promises that they make. This led political parties to cast about for new bases of support, and this put the, the female vote right at the center of the discussion. Women in Europe had long voted disproportionately for conservative parties. Decreasingly, that is true. And in fact, it's a quite dramatic change since the 1970s. It happened first in the Scandinavian countries and started in the Netherlands quite early, but it's spread across Europe. And now if you look at Southern Europe, which is sort of the later wave of this, women now tend to vote for left parties rather than for conservative parties. The gender gap has basically flipped. Um, and again, I have a nice graph showing that, but you'll have to trust me on that. Okay. Um, in some cases, what happened was a clear realignment of women to left parties. So this happened, as I said, first in the Netherlands. It happened later in Germany. In other cases, women became floating voters. This is what they called them in the UK, because they, they detached from the conservative party, but they didn't fully reattach to labor. So they just seemed to be kind of permanently disgruntled um, and possibly then available for either party if they're able to draw them in. So the response of parties to this situation uh, was twofold. First, they worked to feminize their party structures. They adopted quotas and informal measures that would increase the number of women in parties. And this, in turn, then led to a steady increase in the percentage of women in parliament. 
And this happened first on the left, it happened first with left parties, but then right parties felt pressure to do the same thing, because they looked bad if they didn't at least have some kind of informal quota. Um, so they ultimately, most of uh, the center-right parties moved in the same direction, at least to some extent. So the end result then is growing proportions of women in parliament. Yep. Uh, would it be easy to pull them up? I can do that. In other words, I have your, I have your uh, paper right here in front of me, and I can oh. speed the graphs. So if I project it on the screen, you can put the graphs up there. If you want to just oh, go okay. on like you are now. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll just go on as I am. Hmm? I'll just go on as I am. Okay. Yeah. I should have talked to you before, though. We were trying all these different things, and somehow <laughs> none of them worked. So that would have been the answer. Um, I, I, I the mock, so oh, okay. Oh, great. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. So you can see some of those graphs then. Uh, growing proportions of women in Parliament. The second thing parties did was feminize their party platforms, adopting issues that they uh, thought would appeal to female voters. And I think the important step in this causal chain was that the first trend very much influenced the second one. That as more women got into party politics, and particularly as they rose up in parties to positions of power, those women then pushed issues of concern to the female electorate and pushed those onto the party agenda. And they often had to really fight for this. Um, but I think what was particularly useful for them was the fact that there was this perceived electoral competition so they could make the case that if we put these issues in our agenda, this will help us with the female vote. And that gave those women more credibility within the party. And one of the many issues then that was seized upon was this issue of work and family, which was, it was blatantly obvious in the UK and Germany and the Netherlands that there was no support for working parents. And so this was an issue that clearly people were increasingly discontented with given the rising rates of women's workforce participation. So I think there's been a, a common chain of events then in these three countries. The feminization of the political parties, first on the left and then on the right, changing party platforms and electoral competition around the issue of work and family, in which the political parties tussle over what to do about work-family issues. Conservatives initially basically hew to the male breadwinner line, but then ultimately abandon it, albeit with grumbling, in some cases more grumbling than others, but basically they, 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 soft, they soften the tone or they just completely abandon the, the stance. And then ultimately the adoption of reforms that have usually been shepherded by women ministers, women within the party who have risen up to a position of uh, significance. So um, I was just going to walk through two examples, the UK and the German case, and I'm happy to talk about the Netherlands uh, if anyone's interested. Um, but to talk a bit about the UK, um, it's the story really kind of starts with the Labour Party and the crisis that the Labour Party was in in the 1980s. They repeatedly lost the elections, 1979, 1983, 1987, and 1992. Uh, each defeat uh, worse than the previous one, in a sense, or perceived as even that much more devastating. And this spurred an effort at internal modernization and <coughs> reflections about how to reform. And there are a number of ways labor reformed, moved towards being new labor. But one of the things that it did was start to turn towards female voters who were appearing in the polls that were being done uh, uh, to be less reliable Tory voters than they had been in the past. And especially significant were signs of a gender generation gap, that younger women were in particular not interested in voting for the Tory party. And as this represents <coughs> the future of voters, this was, of course, very interesting for the Labour Party. In the 1992 election, studies showed that uh, Labour would have won if the gender gap had been on Labour's side. They lost because the gender gap was not on their side. Um, thus, in 1993, they adopted party quotas to increase uh, the number of women in the party. And in the 1997 election party manifesto, it was very much crafted with women in mind, with a lot of emphasis on social welfare programs and so on, health care and education and, and everything else, with in mind appealing to um, uh, women voters. The election in 1997, Labor won and, it, and brought in the largest percentage of female parliamentarians in the country's history because they, throughout the 90s, been promoting this increase in women within the party. But it did take a while for the party to actually figure out how to start to address the needs of these women voters. Uh, and they were pretty ham-handed about it. On um, their first term, they made highly publicized efforts to deal with child poverty and invested in education. But the way they talked about child care and work family policy was always very much through this lens of dealing with poverty. So it was a kind of means-tested view of, of the issue. In the 2001 election, however, um, there's a much stronger interest in women's voters, a lot more attention to that within the party, but also women have now moved into greater positions of power within the party. 
So Patricia Hewitt became head of what uh, was called the Department of Trade and Industry and also women's minister that combined those two things together. She was a feminist who's actually written a lot about work family issues. So she was someone who was well educated on this issue and cared about it a lot. And she became an extremely important voice for reform as did a bunch of other women working within the Labor Party and within the ministries. Now, following 2001, there are efforts then to address the work family issue, but in a much broader way, thinking about this is not a means tested question, but something to think about for the electorate as a whole. Thus, the expansion of the parental leave or the maternity leave, the increase in its pay, the adoption of tax breaks for childcare that a broader array of people can benefit from, and the entitlement of everyone to a certain amount of free preschool hours. And that entitlement would expand. And you'd see in every election promises made to expand these policies, and then those promises would be basically implemented in 2005 and so on. So I think the power of the issue is really evident also in the political competition going on during elections around this, this work family issue. And it's especially <coughs> notable in looking at the evolution of conservatives on this. Um, the conservatives trying to figure out how to place themselves after their defeat in 1997, they decided in 2001 to go with a family values line, which they had completely imported from the United States. And they were reading all these you know, Heritage Foundation documents and stuff in the United States. And they decided to go with family values, marriage promotion, traditional family, and all this. And that completely failed them. Uh, you know, it didn't work. It didn't resonate. They abandoned it then in 2005. In 2005, they suddenly start to say, ah, oh, we need to make our you know, welfare state more friendly to women workers, and we need some work family policies. And they basically start to advocate the same policies as labor. They did the same thing in 2010. Basically, the, the things they, they said they wanted to do were the same as what labor and the liberals did. And it was all about expanding child care, you know, parental leave pay going up, and making the welfare state more friendly for uh, women. Uh, does David Cameron actually believe the stuff that he says? <laughs> I actually asked someone recently about this, uh, someone who was very involved in British politics. He said, well, maybe half the time when he bothers to think about it. So he basically kind of said, you know, a lot of this is rhetoric, of course. This is campaign rhetoric. And of course, once in office, Cameron has enacted a whole bunch of uh, uh, cuts to the welfare state, which you think would think would make him very unpopular with voters. In fact, this has energized a kind of counter movement against him that's very much put in gender terms, as in, you are cutting the welfare state, this is going to cost you the female vote. That's how it's being presented in a lot of the debate. So it's interesting, there's a perception, at least it seems, in the politics around this, that that is going to hurt him. Um, I, uh, looking carefully at what he has cut, he has not touched the maternity leave pay, he has not reduced that, he has not cut child care except in the sort of most means-tested way. He's going after the poor. was not nice in his policies. Um, but I guess he's probably thinking the poor are not going to vote for him anyway. Um, but at least the middle class, maybe he's going to try to keep them happy. So it seems like he's thinking about this uh, in terms of the way the cuts have gone. Um, but I think this is still a kind of unfolding issue. To walk through another example, the case of Germany is an interesting one. Left parties faced a similar problem of the t decline of the working class constituency, um, by, certainly by the 1970s, and in the 1980s, the Social Democratic Party starts reaching out to female voters. In 1988, they adopted a quota for female parliamentarians, and in 1994, they expanded it to be 40%, so that 40% of the parliamentarians would be female. The result then was steadily expanding numbers of female parliamentarians. So when the SPD came to power in 1998 and then again in 2002, one would have thought they would have enacted a lot of these kinds of reforms around work and family. So first it's kind of a puzzle about why they didn't do more, because they didn't actually do much, uh, not until at least 2002. And I think one answer lies in the fact that they weren't in power as long as labor. So the Labor Party in the UK came in, they talked that all this talk about uh, work and family, but then they seemed to have no idea how to actually enact policy. And it took them a while to actually enact some policies that were kind of helpful. Um, and I would say that, um, you know, the sort of the SPD when it came into power was sort of similar. It first came in and focused on establishing its sort of uh, neue Mitte bona fides, like we are the new middle and here's our anti-employment stance and we're going to focus on labor market reform and rather than talking about <coughs> expanding the welfare state. They made some minor reforms to parental leave, but that was about it. They did not pursue much of a reformist agenda in 1998. But I think possibly one reason why was because they weren't really competing with the CDU on this issue. The CDU, the Christian Democrats, were still very much in their old family values. We can't have child care because that's just Eastern Germany and that's communism and you know we can't promote working women because it's bad for the family. So the CDU hadn't changed their line at all. So in a sense, the SPD was not really competing with anybody over this. You start to see some change, though, in their second term in 2002 to 2005. And I think there's a couple of reasons why. 
First, now there were six female ministers out of 14 in the government, which changed things. And a woman, uh, Renata Schmidt, now took hold of the Ministry of Family Affairs. And she developed a, pl a plan for a parental leave reform that was very much like that which would ultimately pass. And she got through an initial measure to increase childcare spending. So you finally start to see some change in policy. But basically what happened is the government you know, had a political crisis, had to call new elections, and so it lost its opportunity to show us whether it actually really was going to follow through and do more <coughs> significant reforms, like adopting the parental leave. Uh, but I think what was notable about what Schmidt did, though, is she laid the groundwork for an interesting demographic argument about the need for reform, which is a way to try to figure out how to sell these reforms, that Germany's birth rate had sunk to record low levels, and there was a growing sense that this reflected the complete inadaptability of the welfare state to the needs of working mothers, that the lack of childcare services, the very ill-adapted school system with ridiculous hours you know, for working parents, school ends at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon in uh, elementary schools, the inadequate parental leave, all that was seen as contributing to this problem. So she really is the first one to kind of lay out that language. But the real change then came in, under a grand coalition government in which a Christian Democratic minister, Ursula von der Leyen, another woman, uh, was in charge of the, of the family ministry. And she took a very high profile role in promoting reform. And this is, of course, a very sharp contrast with the past traditionalism of the Christian Democratic Party. And so one should you know, ask what was going on here. And what I found as I looked at this more closely was basically some amount of political competition around this work family issue as conservatives started to recognize the potential in this for salvaging their rapidly declining support uh, among uh, women voters. That the CDU had always relied on women. Women were a core constituency for the CDU. But by the 1980s and 1990s, you see these steady decline, and particularly into the 2000s, uh, even older women start to no longer want to vote for the CDU. And so they start to have big debates, internal debates, about how to reverse this trend. And there's much discussion about the need to modernize and to reach out to women and to reach out to young people. And in fact, the very um, ascent to power of Anglo Merkel in part reflected this idea that, well, here's a young woman from Eastern Germany. This will sort of change the face of the party and modernize the party. Certainly, this was very contested. There was an old guard in the party quite unhappy about any kind of reform and, and quite vigorous debates about this. But nonetheless, with rising numbers of women in the party and their rising significance in the party, they were able to make the case for these reforms. And Angela Merkel and Ursula von der Leyen really sort of exemplify this. And Merkel is an especially interesting case. Uh, I think most people would say that she certainly doesn't identify herself as a feminist. But clearly, she's not a traditional Christian Democrat either. I mean, she's from East Germany. Uh, she had a career as a scientist. She's, she was from a society that had very high rates of women's workforce participation, that had universal child care, that obviously didn't think child care was immoral or bad for, bad for babies, uh, as it was presented in the West, um, and so didn't have the kind of sentimental attachment to this male breadwinner model that, uh, that a lot of the other people within the party did. So she's someone who obviously could be sympathetic to using this issue as a way to appeal and, uh, to women and modernize the party. Ursula von der Leyen is also an interesting woman. She's a mother of seven children who somehow has also been a physician and had a very successful political career. How? I have no idea, uh, you know, especially given that there was no support for her to do this. But anyway, she was incredibly charismatic and very effective politician, very popular. Um, and she was high profile on this issue, kind of seized it and defined it in her own way, even though she was building on what the SPD had been talking about in the previous government. So von der Leyen, backed by Merkel, basically stared down the conservatives in the party and won. Um, and they presented work family reform in a number of different ways. I mean, they presented to the party as a way to modernize and appeal to young people and appeal to women. But they also presented it in the way Renate Schmidt had as a way to address this problem of demographic decline. So as von der Leyen said in an interview, the question is not whether women will work. They will work. The question is whether they will have kids. And that was how one of the ways she presented this to the public to make this more acceptable. And thus what followed from this, I think, were some of these really transformative changes that came in 2006 and 2007 that really fundamentally altered the way um, work family policy is conducted in Germany. So um, I'm going to skip the Dutch case, but I'm happy to talk about it more and just kind of conclude about a couple of thoughts uh, coming out of this paper. Um, and one thing that I felt, uh, having done this research, um, is that I, I came away somewhat convinced that the welfare state is still there as a power resource for political parties. 
Uh, a lot of the older literature about the origins of the welfare state always conceptualized the welfare state as a power resource, that you could use it for electoral gain, that you can use it to cement the support of constituencies, that you use these <coughs> expansive universalistic policies to do that. But that, um, you know, in the, in the literature on the crisis of the welfare state and retrenchment, there's a kind of sense that that power resource had been lost. And I think, in fact, in this instance, parties were finding ways to uh, exploit this power resource and try to use it. Um, but clearly they did so uh, operating under somewhat different dynamics. You know, in the past, parties relied on more stable electorates. Now, with this greater volatility, there's a lot more competition over issues. But at the same time, potentially a lot more movement of parties. I mean, this movement of conservative parties, I think, is really kind of striking. Um, but I think what's clear is that still parties would like to be able to use redistributive policy for political goals. Although, of course, today with the financial crisis, maybe a long time until we see this again, so my article may become yet another historical document <laughs> that doesn't explain anything in the next 10 years from now. But anyway, at least maybe I understood the last 10 years. So I hope at least I can contribute there. Um, I think the second thing uh, I would conclude about the paper is that it really confirms the important role of women in contemporary European politics. And there's a really interesting growing literature on this um, because it has been the big trend in European politics. If you could see my charts, you would see this amazing transformation of the number of women in office. And, you know, from the American perspective where that's like barely changed, it's really striking. Um, and I think there's a lot of literature that has found correlations, statistical relationships between increases in the number of women in um, parliament and all kinds of policy outcomes like, you know, more progressive policies, work family policies, and so on. But I don't think people have fully fleshed out the mechanisms that actually produces. Is it just having more women in parliament? I mean, what, what actually happens? And I think there's really two things, one which some people have talked about and one which virtually no one has talked about. And I think first is to focus on the importance of these well-placed women, women in positions of authority, women who rise up to be ministers, women who are chancellors, women who are, you know, they work their way up through the party. They're very conventional in that sense. We're not talking about sort of radical feminists. We're talking about people who figured out how to work the system. They get to the top or as high as they can, and they use that position of power, often talking to each other and working uh, together to try to get change uh, to happen. So I think that's been, that's one of the important mechanisms. But I think the other dimension of this that um, people haven't really talked about is the electoral connection and the fact that there also has to be, you know, some kind of uh, purported electoral gain. Otherwise, I don't think uh, these women would be as successful as making the case. I mean, I think even Angela Merkel, when people are sort of analyzing the way she thought about stuff and which policies to adopt, it was all about what's going to get my party reelected. And if this issue is going to help us, let's go with this issue. And that that is what brought her on to embracing these reforms more than any kind of feminist agenda that she wanted to achieve. And I think in this sense, the paper um, is kind of congruent with my early book, which I guess gets back to my point that I am kind of repeating myself all the time, but uh, at least I, I think I've evolved a little bit anyway. Um, but, but I think sort of what it reflects is my uh, larger belief that if you want to understand the politics of the welfare state, it's important to look at the social and electoral foundations of the parties that are the ones crafting policy. Um, there's been a tendency in the literature to talk a lot about ideas or to focus solely on institutions. And I guess ultimately I'm a parties person and I think parties always have to be analyzed in light of who they're connected to in the electorate. And that this changing structure of the electorate with the rise in women's workforce participation and all the other changes that I described has been incredibly consequential for parties um, and that they have shifted their agendas in response to this, at least to some extent. And this has led them then to a kind of feminization and modernization of both their party agenda and their uh, and the welfare state. And then I think this dynamism is something that one misses if one focuses too much on path dependency and the various constraints that we tend to think are placed on welfare states. So. Oh. Yeah, I think in the German case, it seems like the rhetoric was deployed as a way to make the issue acceptable, to sort of, as, as one scholar put it, um, I think she put it really well, to sort of turn work family issues from being a soft issue to being a hard issue. Because if it's about demographics, it's about national security, it's about something important as opposed to being not that important, which is sort of how it tended to be viewed. Um, so I think her analysis was really right about that, that it was, you know, that when Renata Schmidt was developing this way of Thinking about it, she brought in all kinds of experts, some demographers and some people who could come help her build the case that this would be sort of a, a rationale, justification for why these policies should be adopted. And especially if you consider how incredibly traditional and conservative the debate had been or the discussion about work and family had been in Germany, I could see why 
you know, there was a casting about for a language that would enable kind of circumventing those conservative concerns, right? I mean, you, know, you can talk about family values, but what if we don't have any families left? I mean, so I, I, mean, I think that's kind of the way it was used, is to say, like, look, we're not going to have any families left, so, you know, we have to, we have to engage in this reform. I think it was absent, though, from the Netherlands or from uh, the UK. Um, I think around all three cases, you can find framing devices and ways in which these policies were presented that reflect the kind of particular circumstances in each country. Um, the Netherlands is a very densely populated, one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Uh, it's, you know, as, as some of the right-wing politicians <coughs> say, uh, the Netherlands is full. We don't need more people. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a place where pro-natalist arguments have any traction whatsoever. Um, if, if anything, it's the opposite. It's like, get those immigrants out of here and let's send a bunch of people, you know, emigrate, go somewhere else. Um, and that's been, I mean, in fact, you know, the Netherlands had an active emigration policy in the 1950s. So it's, um, you know, so I don't think there, and I don't think in the UK either. And I just don't think, I think such arguments would kind of fly in the face of uh, sort of adherence to liberal thinking that there needs to be some kind of limit on what the state can tell citizens to do. So the state can help people when they need support, but it can't mandate that they have more babies. I don't know. I just never saw that in any of the discussions, and I think it would run, it, 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 would, it would sort of encounter the response that it would encounter in this country. I mean, think how people would respond in this country if we tried to advocate, like, pronatalism, like, pe people should have more babies. I mean, that's, people would be horrified, you know, ah, oh, it's the nanny state, or whatever, it's, you know. So, so I think that's, it, it was just not an issue at all. The interesting thing about the Dutch, so, so the reforms that happened, the Dutch case is interesting because actually um, it fits my, my, my argument nicely because it was the first country in which um, you have this really huge increase in women in parliament. It's where you have the earliest crisis in the Labour Party and the, the party reforms itself in the 1970s and 1980s. You get this huge increase in women in parliament and then already in the early 1990s, earlier than the other cases, you start to get the reforms and those reforms just kind of continue. Um, and they're, they're very much championed by uh, a feminist, really one of the founding mothers of Dutch feminism. It was the minister in parliament who was the one in charge of the early child care reforms. Um, and there were other women who later in the 1990s <coughs> were also connected to the feminist movement within the um, Social Democratic Party who continued to do the reforms. Um, but the way the reforms worked out, um, it was, you know, basically, I think because of the very uh, deeply rooted attachment to um, the, the male breadwinner model, and but even more just the idea that children should be home when they're young and mothers should be home taking care of them, or maybe parents, but certainly somebody has to be home taking care of them. I think a, a kind of wholesale shift away from that was viewed as a little bit too radical. So the way feminists within the Social Democratic Party framed it and I think successfully was to say what we need is um, to have a, a, co a combination scenario, they call it, a combinatsi scenario, uh, which is that the child will go to daycare two or three days a week, the mother will work four days a week, the father will work four days a week, each parent will have a day home, you'll have a gender, gender egalitarian division because both parents are taking part-time work, uh, the child won't be in childcare too much because the Dutch still felt kind of uncomfortable about childcare, like Ooh, maybe it's sort of bad. Um, and so that was the idea. Great idea. Uh, so, and, and they, you know, enacted a right for everyone to have uh, access to part-time work. You know, you have a right as a worker in the Netherlands to ask for part-time work. Um, so, and it's pretty, I think, rare that it's actually um, rejected. But then, you know, the way things played out was that, um, you know, men certainly in the Netherlands are more likely to take part-time work than anywhere else in Europe, but they tend to be young men who don't have children. And women overwhelmingly work part-time both before they have kids and certainly when they have kids. I think it's like 80 to 90% of working women, of women with children work part-time. So you have almost no full-time, you, know, uh, you know, five days a week employment of women uh, with children. So then what happens to your combination scenario? I mean, it's there in theory and it's supposed to be gender egalitarian, but the societal practices have basically undermined it. So what you have is women who um, are, you know, work three days a week. There are a lot of protections for women for part-time work. You know, it doesn't hurt you the way it does in the U.S. You have the same social rights and so <coughs> on. In theory, you should be able to advance in your career in the same way. In practice, that doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. I mean, and so women are not striving, you know, reaching the highest, uh, you know, realms of the professional ladders. Uh, or ladder, you know, they're not, they're not climbing up to the top um, because they're working part-time. The incredible thing, or not incredible, I mean, it's just really interesting when you talk to Dutch people. They are so happy with this model. Uh, you know, and you do public opinion polls and ask them, you know, people like this. They're not, they're not clamoring for, you know, 
full equality in childcare. Some people complain, certainly. I mean, the people I know complain, but I, I long ago realized the people I know are never a representative sample of any society. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I actually look at the public opinion data, you know, the part-time work is not forced upon people. In some uh, countries in Europe, part-time work is is, uh, is, uh, is is not desired, and there are these you know, statistics that measure the percent of wanted part-time work and not wanted part-time work. Well, the Netherlands has the lowest rate of not wanted part-time work. Um, and I, I've always been really interested to see how many people I know who work, you know, four days a week even before they have kids. They just want to have a life. It's like such a weird concept to a, an American. I'm always like, what? Um, but, uh, you know, they want more time to do other things. And so it's become really part of the culture to work, you know, four days a week. Um, and especially for women. But I think what happens with men is when they have kids, they start thinking about financial issues. And then, you know, the, you get the division of labor. So the, what men actually do is increase their hours. Um, and they work more than even 40 hours, like they increase, and women's, you know, time and work goes down. So then you end up with a big gap. Um, so that's, that's basically how it's kind of played out. But I think it's, there seems to be no move to change any, any of this. There's other debates around childcare and so on, but I think that the part-time work is the most interesting thing. I don't think any other country in Europe is really pondering, uh, you know, the same kind of thing. I mean, certainly part-time work Possibilities have expanded, um, certainly in Germany, in the Scandinavian countries, even in France, which resisted it, and in the UK, it's very common. But there's nowhere that I think the same kind of right to part-time work or the same embrace of it as a societal value. Um, You know, what happened in the Dutch case is a kind of stasis sets in. You, you sort of arrive at a new model, and everybody's relatively happy with it. And so then the issue, it just falls off the agenda. I mean, you just don't see the issue on the agenda anymore. That being said, there have been some, you know, holes in the model that have been addressed. So, for instance, the school system, there was no system of after-school care. And in the last couple of years, they enacted, they mandated that all schools provide after-school care. So now all schools basically go until 6 o'clock, which is a big change in, in the Netherlands. I mean, think how nice that would be have that here. Um, you know, and it's, and it's part of the public system, too. Um, so that was a really big change. Um, and so I think there are, there are places where they're kind of, you know, if there's a big hole, a big gap that can be exploited and raised, it can still kind of come into play. But um, in terms of sort of another path shift, uh, it does seem like if people are happy with the status quo, then it's pretty much going to continue. I mean, the case where people are at least happy, I think, is the UK. And so it seems like after the financial crisis, when, you know, after, whenever that is, when uh, governments have some more resources, and especially in the UK, it'd be interesting to see, you know, whether this issue will get picked up again and, and you'll see kind of more expansion. Because I think there the changes are really just, uh, you know, they're not as complete as the German cases, or the German or the Dutch case. Um, Germany, you have to see how well the expansion in the childcare system goes, and if there's still a lot of unhappy people. I mean, I think so far a lot. There's, if you read the newspapers, there, there's an enormous amount of grumbling because they, they people have the sense that childcare should be available, and they're like, "Where is it?" Because it takes a while for it to actually manifest itself, and the resources are not adequate to actually achieve the goals, and so people are complaining about that. And um, but I think the complaining is telling. It's important. If that's still you know in the debate, then that should feed in. I would think feed into more expansion. Like I think I used to think that, you know, a utopia could be achieved if you only had the, you know, when I was a naive graduate student who knew nothing about work and family and, um, you know, honestly knew nothing. I mean, I, and I thought, you know, policy should be a short parental leave, get back into the workplace as quick as possible, child care from six in the morning to six at night. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I just sort of like, you know, outsource all your child care and, and be a full, you know, full active participant in the labor force, and I was just convinced that policy could achieve this in some way. And then I sort of realized as I got older, and especially once I had a child, recognized, wow, I was kind of out of it there. Uh, you know, that, <laughs> you know, that there's, there's only so much you can outsource, right? Uh, and there's this kind of hard reality you run up against, which is that most people actually want to spend time with their children. I mean, not everybody does, but, you know, I mean, you have children, you want to spend time with them. I mean, you want to watch them grow up. You don't want to be like, you know, having all, everything happen at childcare. You know, um, so, so I think there's some extremely hard choices that arise always, and they, they can only be partially mitigated. Um, and certainly I think the policies are successful often in promoting women's workforce participation, part-time or full-time. You can kind of see the data. I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of, you know, these policies make a difference for that. But do they actually make it, how much of a difference do they make in people's individual lives and how they feel about the burden? 
Um, I, you know, I, I think no one's ever happy, basically. Um, you know, fully happy, except for the Dutch. The Dutch are so happy. I mean, you know, you talk to women, they're so happy. I mean, they, well, they only work three days a week. I mean, I, I think I'd be happy with that, too. Um, you know, but, you know, it comes at a cost. So I guess in that case, they've decided, well, you know, careers aren't as important to me. But they've made a trade-off um, that they're more or less kind of, you know, um, explicit about. So, I mean, I think the policies are important. Certainly, we need more policies, not fewer, more support and not less. But um, they're still, you run up against the basic difficulties. Um, I think, you know, what every feminist ultimately concludes in talking about this, which is always completely hopeless, is that, uh, or not hopeless, I don't, I don't mean, mean to be too um, denigrating, but, you know, oh, we just need to change men, is always what they conclude. <laughs> not to insult men, but I mean, you know, the reality is the gender division of labor, and, you know, if, if men and women both equally took on the responsibilities and equally faced the burden, then, you know, you'd either have both sides of the family <coughs> miserable, I guess, or you'd have, you know, you'd actually have a, a better possibility of sharing and dealing with the tensions. Um, but if you look at the data, I mean, the change is pretty slow on that. Um, certainly for younger men, it's different. And for all of you who are educated, education is a good predictor of uh, male involvement in child rearing. It's the best predictor. So that's why I say, you know, the people I know are never a representative sample. So I'm never, I never have a good sense about what's going on out in society. But if I get out of my university bubble and I look at the data that shows actually the division of labor across the society, you see how slow it is in actually really changing. Um, and that's not necessarily because of patriarchy. I mean, it's also people's choices. It's also people's values. Um, so uh, I guess I'm kind of like drifting. But um, so, you know, ultimately the policies can only do so much. I mean, societies have to change. Values have to change. And I think it's a really slow process. And, you know, there's only so much the state can do. I, I went to this uh, workshop uh, at uh, Madison. It's called Real Utopias Workshop. We're supposed to talk about utopias that could really happen. So it's kind of weird. Like, a real utopia? Um, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, one of the proposed solutions to this problem was to mandate that men take uh, as much parental leave as women. Just basically say, you know, you have to be home as much. Uh, and everybody was kind of uncomfortable about that. I mean, on the one hand, you know, maybe that, you know, that will force different patterns of care from early on. But, you know, some people are like, well, I'm not sure I'd want my husband to be home. <laughs> That's my daughter. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe that's not what people want, you know. And so to kind of have the state intruding and forcing social change, I mean, I think the Scandinavian countries have tried to do that and go as far as they can. And they've also bumped up against resistance to just how much social engineering you can kind of do. So ultimately, a lot of this has to kind of come from society itself. So my sense of it was that it's uh, middle class women and, and women in the sort of upper 20s, young 30s to 50s kind of range that are more in play. Because those are the ones, if you look at the graphs on voting and, and voting preferences in, in um, Germany, that, that was the, one of the categories that had just really dropped off for the CDU. And there's an important group because they're the future of the party to some degree. Um, you know, I think it's kind of like in this country. I mean, one of the most sought after electoral groups is married women. I mean, both the Democrats and the Republicans worry about married women. I mean, that's, you know, women in their <coughs> 40s. That's, that's a constituency that they care about. Um, so when they think of the gender gap and the actual the analysts think of it, they don't just look at gender. They look at the sort of married women and what they're doing because they're kind of a chunk that they care about. Um, and I think sort of similar in the U.K., it's this, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the term that they use. It's this sort of Middle England woman that was the archetype that everybody was after. So sort of lives in Middle England in a sort of middle class, lower middle class. A married, disaffected, uh, you know, has a lot of, you know, struggles with family and um, values more spending on social services. I and mean, there's a whole profile that the, the pollsters drew up. This was more on the labor side, but then it became the kind of trope that was used repeatedly in the elections, and that was who they were allegedly going after. Was that the worst decision? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's the, that's that's exactly who, who they're after. At least it seemed like in the in the discussions in the electoral platforms. Yeah, so the EU, well, so the, in terms of the timing, I mean, certainly the Dutch case falls earlier. I mean, the Dutch changes started in 1990 and 1994. So I think they predated the whole buildup of that machinery that you describe around the employment strategy. Um, I think in the UK, it seemed to matter for, they had to uh, reform their parental, their, their maternity leave to make it fit with the um, directive. So that was really important because it was a directive. It wasn't the peer review, but they actually had to 
do this change, and the Labour government did it, and they were willing to do it because they were less anti-EU. Um, but in general, uh, you know, certainly no one publicly admits it in Britain that they're doing anything because the EU tells no, them. No, yeah, that's, so. that's, 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 that's for sure. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, so, yeah, it, so it doesn't show up in the discussions. That doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Um, but more broadly, sort of the question of the employment strategy. I actually wrote a paper some time ago where I looked at those peer review documents. I, it, it was a very boring exercise, let me just say. But I read through a whole bunch of them. Yeah. And I looked at the sort of back and forth between uh, the European Commission or Council, I can't even remember now, which, which actor, and the um, gov governments themselves. So they had to file these peer, they had to do these um, kind of reports on. where they would say, like, how, how much have we met the targets of this, that, and the other thing. And I was really unimpressed by the machinery when you see in practice. I mean, people could people put all kinds of stuff, or the, you know, these technocrats would put all kinds of stuff in these documents and turn these into the EU, and then the EU would be like, okay, you know, even though there were many things in there and many aspects of policy in those countries that should have been criticized, that was not meeting standards. And I spent a lot of time kind of looking to see, like, did they raise this point? Did they raise that point? For a whole bunch of countries in Europe. And, and the reality was that it was pretty soft. What I think is more important, though, is maybe through the peer review process, but maybe just more generally, I feel like the whole discussion in Europe about this work family issue has been incredibly influenced by models that people understand from other countries and the way those then get discussed domestically. So I think clearly in the German case, there was a lot of attention to, uh, in the newspaper articles, you see a lot of mention of France and then a lot of mention of the Scandinavian countries, which are examples of high fertility for the Germans. And so since they were framing it in terms of this fertility issue, the media seized upon this and um, you know, spent you know, time talking about how much child care is there in France and why does France do better on these measures and you know, the Scandinavian approach to parental leave. So I think there's more kind of transnational circulation of ideas that's really pronounced. I talked to someone about this in the UK and he was describing the way he was working for a progressive think tank that was developing a lot of these policy proposals for labor, not all of them adopted. And he said, yeah, we were totally influenced by the Scandinavian countries. I mean, we're, you know, we were paying attention to what they were doing. Um, so I don't know if it's the EU per se. It may be that that peer review process facilitates that, but it seems like it's more <coughs> the dialogue that goes on uh, across Europe um, that it's a, it's a bit of a diffuse force. It's hard to kind of put your finger on it or grasp onto it. Um, I don't think I talk about it much in the paper precisely because I don't know how to um, pin it down kind of causally and in a social science way mm -hmm. persuade mm -hmm. anybody. Um, but I think also because I feel like it's a background factor that is – is there, this, the ideas are there, but in terms of which ideas get adopted and when, it seems like it's all about the politics that helps explain the actual adoption. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, what they do is the politicians, if they do something good, they just say, I did it. And if they do something bad, they say the EU made it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they certainly don't want to give the EU any credit. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah, I've never actually done any kind of analysis to try to explain that. I'm sure people have. Um, so you can probably find some literature out there where people have tried to explain these um, these differences in values. I mean, I think kind of what's striking about Germany is that uh, women still are, are they're closer to being skeptical about, you know, child care. Um, you know, it's not half anymore. It used to be a lot <coughs> higher. And in fact, if you look over time, it's a huge drop. I guess that would be another graph that would be useful to have. If you go back to the 1990s, um, the percent of, of people and women included who are opposed to child, or think child care is bad for kids, is way above the majority, it's like 60, 65 percent or something like that. And then it really declines. Like if you look at these value surveys over time, it's, it's pretty striking. The Netherlands is lower, but it's because I think these changes in Dutch society happened earlier, right, as I was describing. I mean, I think the, a lot of the, the changes had, had already been going on, and so the values shift. Um, and then in Great Britain, like you point out, a lot more women have been working, you know, and working in difficult circumstances with no support. and so and using all kinds of weird child care arrangements and so on. So there's a bit more support there. But I guess I don't have a very good explanation uh, for the, for the cross-national differences. I mean, I think usually in, when people um, do the analyses, they find, you know, they'll find it has to do with labor force participation, education, religion, all those kinds of variables would help, would help account for it. I think in Germany, though, there's an added punch of the Eastern European experience that just gave extra stigma to, to child care, um, which was always viewed in, uh, through that light as, as you know, totalitarian, as communist, <coughs> as, you know, the state getting in the minds of young children. I mean, that was such a powerful discourse. Um, and in fact, people even tried to revive it during the debates 
Uh, I think I have a quote in this paper where someone says that, uh, you know, someone within the CDU says that, oh, if we have this child care law, it's, it's letting the DDR rise from the dead, he says. <laughs> um, so there still was an, an effort to try to, like, tap that old view. It didn't work, but, um, you know, there was an attempt to sort of um, touch that nerve. So to take the example of the Social Democrats, I mean, whereas they had been kind of, uh, in Germany, uh, they had been kind of wishy-washy on these issues for a long time. And then in 2002 to 2005, they seemed to th start to move towards a stronger line, but in a sense, they, they sort of didn't act quick enough before the elections were called. So they lost their chance to really kind of t make their mark. And then uh, Ursula von der Leyen and the CDU kind of stole the issue in the public eye, even though it was a grand coalition government. I think she was just such a charismatic figure, she kind of, you know, made the issue hers to some degree. And then suddenly the SPD comes out with like a much more <laughs> progressive line. Yeah. And you sort of look at it and you think like, well, why didn't you do this 10 years ago? But anyway, they've since adopted like, you know, much more um, progressive type stances and you know, haven't been empowered to show us whether they would actually implement them. But at least that's the talk that they've been, that they've been doing. Um, in terms of in the UK, I mean, I think la the labor line is kind of <coughs> the same one. I mean, I think in the 2010 election that they lost, they, they continue to champion these policies to say this is one of our achievements, this is what we would do if we were re-elected, this is what's important to us. Um, uh, I don't know, I haven't really been following, we'd have to see the next election, sort of whether they are going to try to pick this up. I think one interesting question is whether these policies, you know, they've sort of been perceived at least by some as important for this electoral context, but do they actually pay off? I think it's one interesting question. It's kind of hard to answer. There's an interesting paper on Spain that tries to look at, you know, there's been a, a government in power there, or there was, there was until recently, two so socialist party governments in power that had 50-50 women, at least in one of them, and very high numbers of women cabinet members in the other. I think I think even had more than 50% women in the second cabinet. And they enacted a host of gender egalitarian reform. I mean, they, you know, and all kinds of changes, um, you know, uh, legalizing gay marriage just to antagonize the Catholic Church, for instance, and to, you know, um, all kinds of laws against, uh, you know, sexual harassment and violence against women, and they, they um, seem to really go out there on a limb to sort of say, like, we're the party of gender equality. And this one paper then looks at voting patterns of women and argues that they didn't gain anything from it. <laughs> and, uh, you, and then the, the question is, why not? And I guess, you know, I think, the reality is, of course, people's voting is very, figuring out why people vote is, is a pretty complicated exercise, and there's a lot of noise and a lot of different issues going on, and other reasons to be disaffected. Um, and so, you know, it seemed like maybe they didn't reap the benefits of doing this. And then you have to wonder if they'll just conclude, like, why are we bothering? Um, <coughs> but I think that's a, it's a surprisingly unresearched question, this whole, I, I just think there's very little research actually on sort of the dynamics of parties and how they think about gender issues or how they think about a host of issues and how they arrive at the issues they champion. I mean, it's, there's just not, I just didn't find that much out there, especially on women's issues. I just, it's not, no one, no one gets inside parties and tries to understand how they, they're thinking about these things. You have to kind of infer it from the outside. If I wanted to work on this for another 10 years, maybe I'd do that. <laughs> Trying to move on. What do you want to move on to? Yeah, if I had time to think about that, maybe I could answer that question. <laughs> uh, what am I working on right now? Well, so I totally changed gears. I wrote a book on American health policy. That was another more recent book that came out. Um, and somehow that topic so depressed me that. <laughs> I can't work on it anymore. Uh, I mean, it was really interesting to work on it, but the American healthcare system is so messed up that, um, and it's just so hard to envision for a political scientist who cares about politics and a political pathway for change. And that it's it's hard to see it. So I got a little depressed actually by the end of that book, and. Uh, so for whatever reason, that made me go back to Europe and s to study immigration. I don't know why I think that's going to be a more um, <laughs> optimistic topic. Uh, but that's sort of my latest. I'm, I'm working on some uh, paper on uh, Dutch immigration policy, and I'm just kind of poking around to see. I mean, this, that's been the ba big debate in most European countries has been on immigration. Lately. So there's a lot to look at, but I don't quite figure out what I mean, I guess there's certainly examples where, like, rhetoric outruns reality in terms of the actual policy. So, 
governments can claim they're doing a lot more than they're actually doing. Maybe a lot of people say that about new labor, that they sort of talk this talk and then the reality is kind of paltry. Um, it does seem like women in, in the UK are just perpetually disaffected, so maybe that would be an argument for the fact that if you don't actually enact a coherent set of policies that people can identify what they are and benefit from them, you're not going to get any political credit. You know, whether, whereas it's, it's really clear, I think, in the other cases, um, what the policies were, who enacted them, people see real change in their lives, people see transformation in their society, it's a lot, it's, it's a much clearer translation of um, goals into you know, change in people's lives. Um, so, yes, I think one could then speculate that uh, if you don't actually craft good policy, then you're not going to get any. You're not going to get anywhere with it. Well, I mean, in this case, it's very clear. It was never implemented. Yeah. In other words, not, you never had a constituency that got the benefits of the policy. Right. If you had had that, then it would have been much harder to reverse. It was yeah. Never implemented, and so then it was much easier to reverse. Yeah, you didn't get the sort of policy feedbacks and where you should, you know, knit a constituency to. A government out of their gratefulness for the reform. Yeah, maybe that's why they overturned it so quickly. I guess <laughs> they didn't want him to get any credit. It's hockey player. Interesting. Anyone else? No. Well, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>